Good morning, Salesforce. How's everybody doing? Sat through a couple sessions already this morning, got some coffee. My name is Mike Salem. Uh, I am a principal solution engineer here at Salesforce, and one of my main focuses uh, is Einstein vision. So we're going to talk about what Einstein vision is, what Einstein language is, uh, and how you can get going quickly and train your AI model like an expert. So first thing we're going to go over is that uh, any purchasing decisions that you make here at Salesforce have to be based on currently available technology. The really cool thing about this session is that everything we're going to talk about, you could go out and use and uh, have today. So if any questions come up out of the audience that is forward-leaning, I'll make sure to bring that up. But everything we're going to talk about is available today. So this session is going to cover three things. First off, we're going to talk about what is Einstein vision, what is Einstein language, what are the keys to a great data set when you're working with these technologies, and then what is this concept of agile AI that we'll get into. So as we all know, the amount of unstructured data that's being created every day is growing at an exponential rate. And companies that truly know how to harness that unstructured data are unlocking tremendous business value. And if that's a new term for anybody, unstructured data really means things like images, text, voice, things that we haven't historically had a really great way to automatically categorize and analyze without a human reading through it and trying to make sense of it. And so that's where Einstein vision and Einstein language really start to shine. And our answer for how you can analyze and automate your unstructured data boils down to these two buckets, vision and language. And now within vision and language, from a product perspective, there's image classification, there's object detection, which we'll go more into detail on, there's sentiment, and there's intent. So basically, if I see pictures or if I'm reading text, how can I automatically know what's going on within each, analyze it accordingly, and then allow you to continue to automate other things within your business process as well. Now, with Einstein Vision, the use cases can range from all different types of industries. And I'll just name a few here. For anybody that's doing any type of social media marketing, we're seeing things like automatic image tagging on the web. In sales and service, we're seeing things from part matching and product identification. Even in the insurance industry, we're seeing things like, how do we tag what kind of cars we're seeing? If there's any damage on the cars, how do we look at things like that? And then also in retail execution, if I'm concerned with share a shelf or what brands there are or things like planogram compliance, how might I be able to use Einstein object detection to understand that as well? And actually, one of our booths there in the Einstein Park talks about this retail execution demo if you want to see that more in detail later. Now, on the language side, Einstein language is powering a lot of the things that we're using already in our products, from things like chatbots, to our voice assistants, which you just heard announced yesterday. Customer service, if we want to analyze things like surveys or cases or emails or any type of feedback where we're trying to figure out where the triage area, tri, uh, areas are and we don't want somebody to have to read through and you know, read call notes and read survey responses and things like that. So what we talk about with vision and language is that the technology can be used in a number of ways. It's not necessarily use case specific or industry specific. It can be used across the board. And really what we talk to customers about is, tell us what you're trying to do, what you would like to accomplish in an ideal world with this type of technology, and we'll figure out the best way to do that for you. So here we're going to start to get into how these data sets work, how you can really get up and running with Einstein vision and language. And there's four basic steps. The first thing you need to do is gather your data. And that's where we're going to be spending a lot of time uh, during the next few minutes in this presentation. You upload and you train your AI model. You test it. You make sure that it's giving you the, the most accurate predictions that you're looking for. And then you integrate it into your apps. And this is also a huge step, because historically, the AI lab, um, the groups and the tech that's been building the AI models, hasn't always been as tightly integrated with the business and the business apps and the end users. And when we talk about Einstein vision and language, because it's baked into everything else that we do here at Salesforce, we're also very good at bringing those AI models, that lab process, into your end user's experience as well. OK, so let's get into keys to a great data set. And you see that I have uh, some apples designating this. So as much as we would like AI technology, for any Game of Thrones fans out there, to be like Tyrion Lannister and just know things, it's not quite how it works. Our, our AI models, regardless of if it's Einstein or anything in the AI world today, only knows what you specifically teach it. And at times, it may seem counterintuitive. 
But if you keep that top of mind, that it only knows what you teach it, you'll have light bulb moments and things will make much more sense for you going forward. So let's talk about an example. Let's think about how you might teach a toddler what an apple looks like. Would you verbally speak to the toddler and give it all these abstract explanations about, well, an apple has curves and a stem and it's smooth to the touch and it's red and be very kind of abstract about it all like you're seeing here? Anybody want to take a guess? See some heads shaking? No. How you would teach a toddler what an apple looks like is you would continually point out examples of an apple over time to the toddler until the toddler intuitively starts to understand how an apple might be different from a pear or might be different from an orange. It's not words and an explanation, it's visual examples and lots of them over time. So on a little bit deeper level, the way Einstein vision is actually working is that it looks at the pixels in an image. It starts to find edges. It starts to identify the object parts and then the overall objects until it understands when I see this kind of image, here's the things within that image that make it the label that I'm supposed to know, that make it an apple or that make it an orange. But the key here is visual representations over time. And all the same concepts that we're talking about here apply on the language side as well. The language side would be examples of text instead of examples of images. So let's look at an example data set. Let's say we have a vision data set that's apples and pears. What's one thing that you know, notice right now about the apples data set? Anybody want to take a guess? I'll try and see if I can hear you. I heard all red. Exactly. So not only are they all red, but they're all, they all have white backgrounds and they all have green leaves on their stem. So they're all very, very similar. Uh, now what would happen if we tried to send in this picture into Einstein vision? Well, it's never seen a green apple and it's never seen anything with a green background, but it has seen green pears. So in this particular example, Einstein vision or any type of computer vision technology, regardless of what product it would be, would probably incorrectly categorize this as a pear, but not because it is, right? An apple is not a pear, but just because it only knows what we've taught it. It's never seen a green apple and it's never seen anything that has uh, a green background. Now let's talk about, yeah, not comparing apples to apples, exactly. <laughs> um, well, let's look at this data set. Now look at the differences here and uh, gonna be focusing on the apple side again. We see different colored apples, green, red, yellow. We see apples with different colored backgrounds, leaves. We see apples that are being held in somebody's hands, etc. So now, if we tried to analyze this image, well, if you look in our data set, we don't have a green apple with a green background, but we do have a green apple, and we do have apples with green in the background. So this is where we can start to talk about representative data sets. And are the images that we're asking our computer vision model to understand that we're using to train representative of what it might see in the future. So in this case, it can use the historical context of what it's learned in the past, green apples, green in the background, to correctly predict this as an apple. Now the other thing I want to bring up is the, the structure of the images that you're using to train your models as well. And this presentation, the content that we put together for this, has been born out of about a year of me working with customers and getting these types of vision models um, going for them. And one of the biggest things I've seen over time is that customers, at least the ones that I've worked with, they have this notion of they need a professional photography studio with professional lighting and professional cameras and has to be pristine and all the parts have to be in mint condition and all this kind of stuff. If you look at this example, let's talk about part matching. Let's say we're doing field service and there's people out in the field that have to take pictures of what they're working on and get some help. Well, in this example, all these parts are the same angle. They all have white backgrounds. None of them are dirty, and they're taken in a place like this. And this is a real example. This is something that I saw and walked through with a customer, and we kind of talked about it. Now, not only are we talking about representative, but with these types of parts, what do you think would happen if somebody who is here sent in a picture from a phone that looked like that part? Greasy, dirty, broken degraded, it's from a mobile phone so it might be blurry, maybe their thumb is covering the camera. Our computer vision model has never seen pictures that looked anything like this. It may have seen that part before, 
But it might have seen the example of that part when it came right off the factory floor and had never seen a day in the field. So we're not necessarily saying you need to think about every variable that might go into the types of pictures that you use to train your AI models. But a, a better way to think about it is, think about what might be coming in from production, what might be coming in from the field, what your end users might actually be asking your computer vision model to analyze, and then use images like that to train it in the first place. Not necessarily the same images, but similar examples, representative examples. That's the, the word that we use, representative data sets. So the next question I get is, well, Mike, does that mean that I need to stop all business operations for the next three years, and I need to go out and take a picture of every possible variable, of every possible example that I want my computer vision model to analyze in the future? There's no way I'm going to do that. And the answer also there is no. Uh, in the computer vision and natural language processing world, we look at agile AI development much like you would look at any type of agile software development. So at the top here, old school, waterfall, nothing works until you get to the very end, proven to not be as effective. On the bottom, agile software development. Each piece is an independent, functioning product that you enhance over time. So bring that mindset into the idea of a minimum viable data set and how you can provide it feedback and how you can iterate and how you can grow that data set over time so that you aren't having to stop everything and not having a data set that works until you get to the very end, but you haven't been able to take advantage of it until then. So let's look at another example, back to our apple and our pear. Again, in that initial data set, if we had sent in this green apple with a green background, you can see that our computer vision model might, in this case, have incorrectly categorized it as a pair. What is that, 83%, so confidence levels and things like that. But when working with Einstein vision, there's also the notion of feedback, user feedback. And this is how we can get into iterative models that support agile development frameworks, but in this AI type of data set way. So let's say I'm a user. I'm using my mobile app. We have Einstein Vision working on the background. I sent in a green apple. Einstein Vision told me it was a pear. I can actually confirm whether or not what that prediction is saying is true. So in this example, I'm saying, actually, no, Einstein, that's an apple. Uh, learn your fruits, buddy. So what that actually does is it'll send feedback back to the model. Einstein can weight user-generated feedback as equal to or more than its initial training understanding so that the next time a green apple comes in, Einstein could correctly categorize it as an apple. We've seen those percentages change now. So this is the model we can take over time to start to crowdsource your data sets so that you can start with a minimum viable data set and let your users start to help you grow it over time. But what would happen if we send in an image that Einstein has never even seen a label for? Remember, in this particular example, it knows two words. It knows apple and it knows pear. So in this particular example, it doesn't even have a word for orange. So it might try to categorize this in one of those two ways as closely as it possibly can. Well, we know that oranges are not apples. So in this example, if Einstein came back and said, hey, this orange is an apple, we would think, well, the technology's wrong, it's broken, it doesn't work, you know, it's not ready, what is this? But in reality, it knows two words, apples and pears. And until you give it anything else, it's not going to be able to categorize it in any other way. It's going to try to force it into those two things. But in addition to the feedback loop process that we talk about, another cool thing you can do is give it the concept of other, a catch-all, a miscellaneous bucket, where if it doesn't know, if it's not an apple or a pear, but it doesn't know what it is, it can also categorize it into this other category. So let's talk about how feedback loops can work with that and how you can grow your minimum viable data set over time. So let's say we have this other label that's available to our end users. We send in an orange. It comes back and says it's an apple. But our user says, actually, this isn't either of those two things, but I don't have a way to correctly categorize it either. So I'm going to go ahead and select that this is, should be other for now. So in this type of example, once Einstein kind of knows that these specific groups of images that are coming in should now be categorized as other, you can see the prediction here from Einstein is actually other coming back. So it's, it's right in the way that it's not any of the first two, so it has to be the third. What we can start to do, if you think about uh, you know, service cloud, list view, QA type of processes, is we can keep track of all this. We can save these predictions in Salesforce, and we can analyze them over time. So I want to break down this list view and what we're looking at kind of frame by frame. 
the first thing that we see is that users are sending in pictures of oranges. That's the first column, sending in pictures of oranges. Einstein is initially categorizing these as apples because those are the only, way, those are the only labels it has. But our users are saying, no, Einstein, these are actually other. So Einstein learns from that information and categorizes these orange for now as other moving forward. So we can see Einstein learning over time from this crowdsourced feedback. Now, if I'm an admin in this system, what this is telling me is that, hey, I should probably go in and add an, uh, uh, an orange label into our vision data set. So that's what this represents here. We started with apple and pear. We quickly threw in other without providing it a lot of data, just giving our users a way to, to kind of put a miscellaneous box in there. And by doing that, now our admin in the system has included an orange label. Now we've triaged what's the most important label that has to come next, and what do I need to do first? Again, not stopping entire business operations and trying to figure out each potential type of image you'd have to take a picture of, starting with something small that works, letting your users give feedback, and iterating over time. So now in the future, if a picture of an orange did come in, we've built the label. Einstein knows the word orange. It knows what oranges look like. And it'll be able to accurately predict what an orange is in the future, all from this idea of minimum viable data set and agile AI development. So I only got a couple minutes left. Uh, I just want to go over what we talked about in summary. Einstein vision and language. That's how we take unstructured data and provide structure to it whether it's images, whether it's text, surveys, emails, cases. Um, there's ways out there to work with video, all kind of stuff. And I think this stuff is really cool on its own, but where it starts to get even more powerful is when you think about how you can combine it with other types of AI technologies. Think about how powerful language plus Einstein discovery could be. You provide structure to your surveys without people having to read through them. You run them through Einstein Discovery, all of a sudden Discovery is finding insights for you on the fly, again, without people having to go through and analyze it all. So these things are really cool in and of themselves, but when you start to think about how you can start to pair them together with the overall Einstein brand or any other kinds of uh, processes or technologies that you want to work, it really is kind of a, a business multiplier in that way. So also keys to a great data set. The model only knows what you teach it. So categorizing an apple as a, or an orange as an apple may seem weird, but if it only knows the word for apple, it's going to try and force it in there. So how you provide those feedback loops and give it ways to learn over time without stopping everything in a very waterfall approach. Variety and field quality. So representative data sets, people holding things, different types of, is it broken? Could it be greasy? Could it be dirty? And also the idea of a production professional photography studio versus someone out in the field with a damaged mobile phone, and how the images coming in from each of those look different as well. And then finally, agile AI, so minimum viable data set. What do we need just to get going? And then how can we let our users give us feedback and grow over time so we don't have to stop everything? Feedback loops, iterate and grow. So the last thing I typically get asked is, well, I don't even, I get everything you've told me. I'm having all kinds of aha moments. It makes sense, but I still kind of don't even know where to get some of these images. Well, more often than not, most of the companies that I talk to have images somewhere. And that's always where we should start. If, you can find, if your company has a repository or a, you know, a, a file storage or something where the images exist, start there, see what you have, curate what you need, see if it's representative, and just start training your model from there and see what kind of results you can get. If you don't have that, if you have zero images, the next best place, I would say, is online. You know, uh, Copyright-free, royalty-free. Uh, whatever kind of images you might find that you could use to get a, a minimum viable data set up and running and go from there. You can do it surprisingly fast. I've built um, you know, what could be production ready models in a matter of hours doing it this way. And then finally, if none of those two options work, just go out, take a couple days, create the data set on your own. It sounds like a monumental task, but as soon as you spend a few hours taking pictures, you're, you're going to have quite a big library um, that's much larger than you initially thought it might be. It's not as much work as it might sound like to say, go and take a bunch of images. It's really not, I promise you. So that's Einstein vision and Einstein language, keys to a, green, uh, a great data set, and how you can kind of iterate with this stuff and grow over time. If you're interested in learning more, uh, Einstein Ridge is on the third floor, where we have a lot of other great booths and presentations going on. Uh, Einstein Park is right up at the front there, where we have a retail execution demo where we're identifying brands on a shelf and, and percentage shelf space. 
Uh, and then we also, on Trailhead, have an Einstein Trail Mix, where you can actually put your hands on your keyboard and learn how to do this stuff for real. Uh, we also offer free access to Einstein Vision and Language. If you go to www.einstein.ai, you can get a developer edition with access to 2,000 free predictions across both vision and language if you want to start to build some uh, proof of concepts on your own. So with that, my name is Mike Salem, Principal Solution Engineer here at Salesforce. Thank you all for joining me and learning about apples and pears and Einstein vision and language. Uh, and I hope you really enjoy the rest of Dreamforce. Thank you very much.